we have Emily Hacker, and she's going to tell us about avoiding murky waters, uh, clear threat intelligence communications, and watercolor painting. So I'm very excited for both those topics. Thank you for joining us today, Emily. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks, Leslie. My name is Emily Hacker, and today I'm going to talk to you about how to avoid murky waters, both in threat intelligence communications and in watercolor painting. So to start, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, as I said, my name is Emily Hacker. And uh, yeah, that is my real name. Um, I'm a threat intelligence analyst at Microsoft and I've been in the industry for about six years. I started out as a technical writer on an intelligence team. And I did that for about a year and a half before I formally transitioned into threat intelligence analysis. So I have the perspective both from an analysis background and a communications background. Prior to Microsoft, I worked um, for a security vendor as a security researcher, and before that, I worked as an intelligence analyst for an oil and gas company, um, which is the same place where I got my start as a tech writer. If anyone has any questions for me later, um, you can find me on Twitter as at Dreadphones. For my security-focused topic today, I want to talk about how to produce clear threat intelligence communications. Communication is a vital aspect of intelligence. In fact, intelligence cannot exist without communication. Um, but in the cyber threat intelligence industry, I have found a lot of resources for people to learn about the technical aspects of the job. And the majority of people that I have worked with have a technical background, uh, but I've noticed there's far fewer resources for people that have that tech aspect of the job down, but wanna learn more about the communications aspect. Some people refer to communication as a soft skill, uh, but I wanna challenge that notion. I'm not really sure what the opposite of a soft skill is, but I think we can all agree that writing and communicating can be really hard. Um, how many of us have ever opened up a Word document to write a report about the latest malware strain that's affecting our industry only to kind of just stare at it blankly, not even sure where to start? Or how many of us have ever read a blog posted online about a new threat only to finish it with more questions than we started with. Clearly communicating intelligence to key stakeholders is important and it shouldn't be written off as a soft skill. To start off, let's define the difference between a news report and an intelligence report. And just to clarify, I'm not knocking news reports. I actually have a degree in journalism and I started my adult life working at a small city newspaper. There is a hugely important role that the news plays in our industry, but it's a different role than that of intelligence. So what role does the news play? Um, to put it simply, the role of news is to inform. A lot of times this is done in a somewhat purposefully generic way, um, as the audience of a news report will vary hugely in background, industry, skill level, interest level. Some news reports can include some generic mitigations. Uh, for example, a news report about Patch Tuesday might include the generic recommendation of patch, but for the most part, a news article you will read is just going to let you know what is going on. An intelligence report should take this a step further. An intelligence report is still informing the audience about the thing that's happening, but what sets an intelligence report apart from a news report is that it helps decision makers make decisions, and that's what intelligence boils down to. To do this, an intelligence report needs to contain actionable information. And while we're on the topic, I will bring up a phrase that many of us have likely heard, which is actionable intelligence. I bring this up because I, I don't want to hear this phrase again. If intelligence isn't actionable, it is just information, not intelligence. Secondly, intelligence reports need to include tailored information, mitigations, and next steps. This is critical for the help decision makers make decision aspects of intelligence. I can already predict some people maybe maybe pushing back on the statement. So I'm gonna pre-clarify by tailored, I don't necessarily mean written for one specific company or one specific recipient. I don't mean that every intelligence vendor should write a different report for each of their clients with information about how TrickBot or whatever has affected them. What I do mean is that a report should be as specific as is required for the audience. If you're an embedded intelligence analyst working with a SOC, this likely does mean that you need to tailor your report um, to just your company. Don't write about Emotet in general, write about whether it's affected your industry 
or write about an incident that you saw in your own telemetry. This also means that you need to include tailored recommendations to help make decisions. Are there specific security controls that your organization should enforce to help stop this threat from affecting you? Should incident responders put in blocks for specific indicators that you're seeing? If you are a vendor, this probably does look a little bit different, but it doesn't mean you aren't still writing tailored intelligence. Part of what sets a vendor like CrowdStrike or Microsoft or Proofpoint or any of the myriad other intelligence providers apart from a security news blog is our ability to tailor our reports with internal data and telemetry. We can write specifically about how we've seen threats used, what we've seen them lead to, what the consequences have been for other companies, and importantly, what our own customers should do to avoid the same fate. Whether you're an embedded analyst um, or a vendor, after your intended audience reads your report, they should walk away understanding both the threat to their organization and what actions they need to take. In order to make sure um, that people understand your report, there's an easy formula of questions that you should be answering. What is the threat? What is the potential impact? And what do they need to do about it? For the first question, you're answering what is the threat? And to do this, you're describing what is happening or you're informing the user. And this aspect of your report is actually very similar to a news report in a lot of ways, which is why reading the news is actually so helpful for intelligence analysis. When you're describing the threat, make sure that you don't just mention a malware family name, for example, because malware by itself isn't a threat because it doesn't have you know, intent or opportunity really. An example of an answer to this question could be something along the lines of, our organization has recently seen a surge in incidents related to TrickBot. TrickBot um, was originally designed as a banking Trojan, but has evolved over time to become a prolific modular malware that can be modified to suit the attacker's specific needs. It is frequently delivered via malicious emails or is dropped by other malware variants, especially Emotet. That was a pretty vague um, answer to that question, but depending on the length of the report, I might add more for the audience, but you get the idea of how you would describe the threat. The next question to answer is what is the potential impact from this threat? And this can be a mix both of things that you have seen in your own internal telemetry and stuff that's been reported from other organizations. For example, for TrickBot, using that example again, you may not have seen it leading to Ryuk in your own organization, but that's still a potential impact, so it would be worth mentioning in your report. However, if you have seen TrickBot in your own organization leading to Cobalt Strike or hands-on keyboard activity and data exfiltration, you would want to include that as well and make it clear that that's already impacting you. Uh, for example, you could say, while TrickBot can be used in a variety of ways, we have seen attackers leveraging their foothold from TrickBot in our organization to deploy Cobalt Strike beacons and perform reconnaissance, and it's likely they will attempt exfiltration of data. In addition, TrickBot has been widely reported to lead to ransomware, especially Rio. The final question to answer in your report is what should the audience do about the threat? And the answer to this question will vary depending on who the audience of your report is, which I'll talk about in my next slide. But in general, it's important for your audience to walk away from the report knowing what steps they need to take. Do they need to block certain IOCs, patch a vulnerability, hunt in their own environment for a certain type of malware or a certain threat, make large organizational changes such as group policies to disallow entire threat vectors. Even though the length and audience of a report may vary widely, answering at minimum these three questions will help your audience understand your intelligence report a lot more than them trying to glean those answers as they're reading it buried amongst all the other data in your report. In fact, for longer reports, I recommend having an introductory section um, or a summary section at the beginning that answers these three questions before you move on to a larger technical analysis or more details. So this brings me to my next point, which is audience. If I am a vaccine scientist writing a scholarly peer reviewed research article about my latest findings, I'm going to write those findings a lot differently than if I'm writing them for an article in the New York Times. The same logic holds true for intelligence communications. Different audiences need different types of information, amounts of data, and levels of detail. Let's say you're an embedded analyst who has just heard about a new malware threat to your industry. A report to your incident response team may just include a brief summary of the threat and a list of IOCs to block maybe, depending on how quickly they need to react. 
a report to your CISO regarding the same threat is likely going to look a lot different than that. A list of hashes probably isn't really helpful or interesting to them. What they want to understand is the impact to the organization and what next steps need to be taken by the larger security organization. If you're a vendor, you are probably often writing reports that will go to a wide variety of audiences. It might include other intelligence analysts, management, threat hunters, incident responders, and you can't write a different report for each one of these recipients. What you can do, however, is have different report sections. Start each report with an executive summary that is enough information for management, which means you'll want to include some recommendations in your um, executive summary. And then you can include longer technical analysis after that for recipients who are maybe also, you know, other intelligence analysts or threat hunters. And then specific IOCs or specific hunting queries can be included in um, a technical appendix for only the audiences that actually really need those for their job. By organizing your report this way, your recipients can read only the sections that pertain to them without shuffling through your entire report, looking desperately for the part that they actually care about. And last, but definitely not least about audience, um, I wanna to touch on responding to RFIs, which are requests for intelligence and getting feedback on your reports. Since the purpose of intelligence is communicating it to other teams, it's critically important that those teams understand and find value in your reports. Make sure to develop relationships with the audiences of your report. Ask them to provide feedback for how they'd like to see changes going forward. Set up RFI processes with key stakeholders um, so you can ensure that you're going to be writing about the subjects that they actually need to learn about. Intelligence is only valuable if your audience understands it, so make sure that they do. So far, I've talked a lot about reports, um, but I want to take a moment to define all of the different ways that intelligence reports can take form. Anytime that you're communicating information about a threat, its impact, and what, how it can be dealt with, I'd argue that you're sharing intelligence. In written form, we do most commonly think of this as an intelligence report. We probably have these get sent to us from vendors or we see them posted online. We might have to write these ourselves. And they take a lot of time and a lot of research and they probably involve several layers of editing. Hence how I got my start in the industry. But that's not the only form of written intelligence. How many of us have ever pivoted on something in our own environment that we found on Twitter? I certainly use Twitter for intelligence. I often will see tweets that are along the lines of, hey, I'm seeing a phishing campaign using Teams lures to get users to click on a credential phishing link. The senders are using Gmail accounts and the subject lines all contain new message for you. And um, it'll probably contain a screenshot of the email a lot of times. And there you go, that's intelligence. What's the threat? A fake Teams phishing campaign. What's the potential impact? Loss of credentials. What are the next steps to take? Search your environment for emails that match those details. Another type of written intelligence um, a lot of us probably do, but don't really think about as much are incident write-ups. Anytime you're documenting your investigation for an incident, you're documenting intelligence. Keep that in mind when you're doing write-ups and consider how helpful you're being for yourself the next time you face the same threat. I have certainly been guilty of feeling rushed and writing my incident write-ups really fast, thinking that nobody's ever gonna see that, nobody really cares but me. And then two months later, the similar threat impacts my organization again. And I come back to it thinking, wait a minute, like how did I deal with this last time? How did I find all the effective machines? What did we do about this? Writing that information down the first time will help your team and your own future sanity. Intelligence doesn't have to be written down though, in order to be intelligence. Verbal intelligence is just as important. And this could take the form of maybe a vendor call to a customer, letting them know about a threat um, that's impacting their industry. This could be kind of in the same way as a report, but in verbal form, or maybe it's a call with other industry analysts. If you're on a call with those analysts and you hear someone say, we've been seeing a lot of ICE ID lately, that's not really all that helpful. Um, but if you hear them say, we've been seeing a lot of ICE ID coming in through email and leading to hands-on keyboard data exfiltration, it's a lot more helpful, especially when they follow it up with indicators or TTPs or something that you can actually pivot on. Even the dreaded management presentation is an important form of intelligence. 
in one of my previous roles, we had to give a monthly intelligence presentation to upper management. And while I dreaded it because it was nerve wracking, it was admittedly one of the most impactful methods we had to enact change. These presentations didn't just include information on what we were seeing, but recommendations on what actions management should be taking to protect the company, combined with data from multiple incidents and how the change would impact the organization. Management was able to walk away equipped to make a decision, and sometimes those decisions would cut off entire entry vectors that had been plaguing us for months. Stuff like that really highlights the value of intelligence. If you can tell your audience what the threat is, how it impacts your org, and what they should be doing about it, you can help defend against malicious activity. So we just talked a lot about a bunch of different forms of reports, and you may have noticed that um, they would have varied a lot in what kind of content you would include in those different forms of communication. And that makes sense because intelligence isn't a one-size-fits-all approach. Different intelligence teams do different types of work and therefore produce different reports. I've heard different terms for these three types of intelligence, um, and people might think of these differently, but these are the ones that have resonated with me that I've seen reflected in my daily jobs, um, but it's the concept behind the terms that are important, so I'll talk about them. The first type of intelligence report that I want to talk about is one that is a tactical report. These reports are oftentimes going to be related to an ongoing incident or an investigation and might be sent to your SOC or your IR team to help them in their remediation efforts. A lot of times these reports are going to need to be sent out pretty quickly, so you aren't going to have the luxury of spending weeks doing research, looking at evidence, crafting your message, going through editing. Um, they're usually just going to take the form of a few sentences that answer your three critical questions. What is the threat? What is the impact? What do they need to do about it? And then that's kind of it. They might include a list of IOCs or something as well. If you're an embedded analyst, you might find yourself needing to send out this type of report a lot. So it's probably helpful to have a quick report template that just basically outlines those three questions for you to answer and get sent off as is. The next type of report is an operational report. This is kind of actually where I live currently in my current job, so I can talk about this one a lot. Um, and it's kind of the bridge between tactical and strategic. So it's more than like a one-off incident, but you're not necessarily detailing an entire actor's activities. This may look like a report about how a specific malware variant was observed during a few months period of time. It, prob it, it probably will be including a lot of information from multiple incidents, so not just one, and it would include the various infection vectors and kill chain from those incidents, but it's not going to go into detail about every way that malware has been used over the course of history or necessarily who the operator of that malware is. What is still important though are those three questions that I've talked about a little bit too much probably now. Um, those questions can still be answered, but this report will probably be more detailed than a tactical report and include more research, and it'll probably take a little bit longer to publish if it has to go through a editing process or a review process. Strategic reports are the highest level report in that they cover a lot of information. The um, the now famous Mandian APT1 report is an example of a strategic report. It covered the actor, who they were working for, where they worked, um, what types of threats they had been using, what their goals were, so on. It didn't really detail a single incident um, or necessarily a single campaign. It was a much higher overview of the actor. Now, if you are an embedded analyst, you might be thinking that an APT1 report isn't really something that is in your purview, given how much time and dedicated research effort is required to produce that and how frequently you have to adjust to the changing threat landscape. There are still opportunities for strategic reports for you too, though. To me, I would imagine this looking like a report detailing a number of campaigns that all used the same entry vector and tactic, maybe word macros, and a suggested mitigation, such as disallowing macros that come in documents from the internet. This report would probably be going pretty high up your management chain and would require a lot of research over the course of several incidents, um, some external research, hard work, editing, and would be suggesting a whole new strategy that the company could take to defend, defend against attackers. Um, so to recap the difference in these three types of reports, a tactical report is one incident, 
an operational report is multiple incidents strung together into a campaign. And a strategic report is multiple campaigns strung together to show a pattern or a strategy. All three types of these different types of intelligence may have different reports that fall into them. And there may be some reports that you are producing that you don't really feel like fall nicely or neatly into any of these, and that's okay. What is important is to answer your three questions and get um, audience feedback going forward, and you'll be good to go. So now that you know what to do, I want to talk a little bit about what to avoid when you're creating an intelligence report. To start off, it's important to avoid jargon, um, especially if you're writing a report for a varied audience, such as customers or management. You may know what you're talking about, but at the end of the day, it's more important for your audience to understand your report than it is for them to know how smart you are. Not to mention, a lot of jargony reports that I've read are using that technical language to describe how something is working, and they never really use any time of the report to describe why I should care about that thing. The second pitfall to consider is timeliness versus completeness. Is it more important to let your audience know about something now or to wait and to make sure they know more details later? Depending on the type of report you're writing, the question, this question is probably pretty easy to answer. Um, for a tactical report, timeliness is critical. You can send an update later if you learn something more. For a strategic report, completeness is key. For an operational report, though, it can be a little bit more tricky. So knowing that it's tricky can help you work with your team, your management, your editors ahead of time to determine which reports are more timely and um, which ones need to be more complete. And finally, don't overwork your report. I know that writing and communicating can be very difficult, and it can be tempting to want to make changes and to make little edits forever or to suddenly question your own analysis as soon as it's about to be sent off to the customer, or to think that you really just need to wait for one more bizarre loader incident before you're ready to talk about that malware. But at some point, you just have to ship your report. When it's ready, it's ready. And if you keep adding to it, you're eventually going to be taking away more than you're actually adding. Which brings us to watercoloring. Similarly, with a painting, if you add to it, too much, you're eventually taking it away. So for my non-technical hobby slide today, I want to talk about watercoloring. And I actually picked this up um, during the pandemic. So it's a fairly new hobby to me. I started learning it from YouTube or blogs online and stuff like that, but a lot of those were geared towards people that already had some experience with painting or art, which I did not. They weren't really geared towards total beginners. So today I wanted to talk as someone who is a beginner for other people who may be interested in picking up this as a new hobby for the first time. I chose specifically to talk about this versus one of the hobbies that I've been doing much longer because I think it's a fun way to help newcomers into the hobby together so we can all learn together. Plus, if you're new to a hobby such as painting, especially you know watercoloring, um, it can be a little demotivating if you're talking to someone who has been doing it for a long time and you find that you cannot reproduce their paintings or anything close to what they're able to produce. Um, so I have some examples in my slides uh, that are what the paintings of someone who is brand new to this hobby would actually look like. In addition, I, I want to talk about watercoloring because I feel like it's a hobby that's super accessible. As I was thinking about what of the hobbies I have I might want to talk about, um, some of my hobbies felt less accessible, such as like running or exercise, not great for a varied audience, which we talked about with intelligence communications. Some of my other hobbies like hiking, it kind of depends on where you live. Um, so I didn't really want to talk about that. And then stuff like the piano, I was like, okay, well, you have to own a piano. And so I found that watercoloring is a hobby that is super accessible that a lot of different people can do from, you know, it doesn't really matter where you live. It doesn't matter what stage of your life you're in. It's something that you can kind of pick up at any point for a lot of people. So out of all the different types of art available that I could have chosen to talk about, why am I talking about watercoloring? I tried 
every type of art imaginable during this pandemic, trying to find things to do. So I tried acrylic painting, I tried pastels, digital painting, colored pencils, you name it, I probably tried it. And watercolors ended up being my personal favorite because I have felt less pressure to be perfect. Maybe this is a perfectionism thing, um, but I don't have a lot of natural drawing talent. And I found with certain art mediums, such as colored pencils, you kind of have to be able to draw in order for your art to look anything like what you wanted it to look like. With watercoloring and some other types of painting as well, I have found that it's a lot easier because you kind of just do a couple of like brush strokes or like dabbles on the page and it kind of ends up looking like, you know, a flower, which is mostly what I end up painting um, or something along the lines of what you wanted it to look like. Additionally, I have found that watercoloring is less commitment than some of the other types of painting that I tried. So something like oil painting or acrylic, I need a canvas or a board and I feel the need to fill that whole thing up with a background and a full scene or like a landscape. With watercolor, you're just doing it on paper and I feel like I can just kind of doodle almost with watercoloring. And it feels like so much less of a commitment than filling up a whole canvas. Um, it, when I was doing some acrylic painting, it felt a little daunting to have the whole canvas and be like, okay, I'm gonna have to fill this whole thing up. But because watercoloring is just on paper, it's not daunting at all. Um, thirdly, I have found that for me, it's very calming. Um, it's relaxing, it's semi-mindless. It's something that I can do while I'm listening to music or listening to podcasts. It's something that you could do while you are listening to a virtual conference put on during a pandemic. Um, you can do it with others when we can do anything with others or you can do it by yourself. And that makes it a really nice hobby for me to have. And then finally, as I mentioned, I picked this up during the pandemic, which was nice, but I also found that I think going forward, it'll be very good for me for winter because most of my hobbies are outdoor hobbies and um, they're not always feasible in the winter. So to start out, I wanted to talk about the difference between acrylic and watercolor because I know acrylic is another kind of beginner painting medium that people will pick up. So I wanted to use these two paintings as an example of what I was talking about it being less of a commitment. So the painting on the left is one um, that I did using acrylic and I it is my attempt at painting the crow that lives outside of my apartment. And as you can see, I used a canvas and I felt the need to fill up the entire thing. So I painted the whole sky and I had to paint around my bird and everything. Um, and that was a little stressful. And then also it required me to have an understanding of perspective. So like actual art talent that I don't really have. So the buildings in that um, painting look a little wonky because one is supposed to be across the street. Um, and it just, it, it took a lot more time and planning than maybe I was willing to give to any hobby during the pandemic or ever. Um, especially something that I'm brand new at. One pro for acrylics is that you can paint light on top of dark. So you can see my crow's beak and his eyes are gray and I painted those over top of his black um, feathers. And in addition, the building across the street, the windows and the lights on the roof were painted on top of the darker brown once it had already dried. So that's, that's nice because I didn't have to plan out space for those ahead of time. The picture on the right is a little bird that I had painted when I was very new to watercoloring. Um, and you can see that there's no background, there's no scene. Um, he's just a bird. I painted you know, a couple of brush strokes just for a branch for him to sit on, but I didn't feel the need to fill up an entire scene. Additionally, he's just painted on watercolor paper. So I wasn't devoting an entire canvas or board to this painting that didn't feel like I was wasting money or something if I messed it up. Um, also, one pro for watercoloring is that it's really easy to mix the colors. So my bird has both blue and purple feathers and they mix together nicely versus my crow, the white detailing on his wing, it, does, it didn't blend very well, it just looks like lines. One con for watercoloring is that you cannot paint light on top of dark. So um, for my bird's beak on the right, I had left space for the orange beak, but you can see where it touches his, like the blue paint, it kind of melded together um, and doesn't look great. And then also the budding leaves that I had put on my tree branch, you can see the branch through them because the light green is significantly lighter than the dark brown branch behind them. So if any of this sounds intriguing to you and you're interested in getting started with watercoloring, there are some supplies that you're going to need. 
And you can buy the majority of these in a starter kit, which is what I did. I bought a watercolor starter kit from Michael's and it was super affordable and it had enough supplies for me to determine if watercoloring was something that I was actually going to be interested in. Once I decided it was, I did end up switching out some of these items for um, higher quality versions of them, but I'll talk about which ones I switched out when I get to them. So the first supply that you're going to need is paint. This um, seems pretty obvious. There are two types of paint in watercoloring. There's paint that comes in a tube that um, is like a gel consistent. Let's see, it looks like a what you might expect acrylic paint to look like, but it's watercolor. And then there's paint that is dry and it comes in a palette, like what you might remember from like elementary school when you had those Crayola paints in the palette that you could paint with. Um, I have only used the tube paint. So this is an example of the two types of paint that I'm talking about. Um, I've only used the tube type paint on the left there. I have not used the palette paint yet. So all of my recommendations here are based specifically on the tube paint. I don't know if they would be different for the palette paint. So just something to keep in mind. I will say the paint that came in my starter kit has proven to be good enough for me for a beginner. I am aware that nicer paints will make nicer paintings. However, as a beginner, I'm really still learning the techniques of how to paint with watercolors and what I really enjoy doing. And having nicer paints isn't going to make me a better artist yet. And so I am I have found that the starter kit paint is more than sufficient for someone who's really just starting out in this hobby. The next item that you're going to need is thick paper. Um, obviously, regular paper like printer paper won't do for watercoloring because it's water. So the paper, paper will get all messed up and wrinkly and wet. Um, so you have to buy specifically watercolor paper. The paper that came in the starter kit that I tried was good enough, but I will say it was a very small ream. And so once I decided that I liked watercolor and wanted to get into it more, I ended up going out and buying more paper, like a bigger ream of paper. And while I was there, I just bought thicker, nicer paper. Um, Additionally, you're going to need one nice brush. I have found that the starter kit came with like five brushes and um, I tried them all out and it was nice to be able to try them, but um, I didn't end up needing that many brushes and it, the nicer the brush you have, the better it'll be able to hold on to water and paint. And so it actually does kind of matter to have a nicer brush. So once I had tested out all the brushes from the starter kit, I went back to the store and bought a upgraded, much more quality version of the one that I actually ended up um, liking and using. And it has helped significantly. I will say though, this does, you know, kind of depend on the fact that I have been doing very small paintings. I'm not doing like these huge scenes. And if I was, I would probably um, need a bigger brush as well to paint the background. Um, but because I'm just doing little flowers and stuff, um, I haven't needed that. And the one brush is good enough for like doing small details with the, the tip of the brush. And I can push down more to get like leaves or um, bird feathers, if you will, just whatever I'm looking for. The next thing that you will need is a palette. The palette that came in the starter kit is the only thing that I will say that I was not a huge fan of from the starter kit. It was kind of small and flimsy and it really only had room for like six colors, but not a lot of room to mix them together. So I did actually go back to the store and buy a better palette. Um, I actually have it right here and you can see that it has, it's a mess right now, but it has room for five colors. But what I like is that it has this like trough area um, and I have used that for mixing the paint colors together usually with a white and so I get a gradient of that color in the trough area and then I can just pick from the gradient for what I'm looking for and I can do something like what I attempted with these attempted cherry blossoms in the left of my slide there I just kind of picked it's all just one red that I mixed with white and then I just picked different um, pieces of paint off the gradient to make which color flower I was looking for. Um, the next thing you're going to need is actually two jars or cups. If you've done painting in the past with like acrylics or um, 
oil painting, you only need one, but with watercolor, you actually need a clean water horse as well. So you will need two, just something to keep in mind, and you won't want to contaminate um, your clean water with dirty water. So that's all you're going to need, um, but there are some optional items that you can add if you would like that um, I have found have made my paintings more professional looking or in general just more fun. And the first one is washi tape. So washi tape is very inexpensive and it can be purchased almost anywhere. I got mine at the art store. Um, and what it does is it adds a nice crisp border. There we go. A nice crisp border to your painting. So you can see what I did here was I had two scenes from kind of the same painting and I had taped around both of them. So it kind of gave it this like comic book feel where there's like two frames from the same scene. And in addition, it gave it a nice crisp line around the outside as well, because without that, you wouldn't really be able to achieve that with water coloring um, since water is wet and it'll just go all over your page otherwise. Additionally, it is very satisfying when you have finished a painting to peel off the tape and reveal that very crisp line below. Um, it's worth it just for that. Additionally, another thing you can add to your painting is pens and ink. So I've heard about this online when I was researching watercolor. I saw a lot of people posting art that they were saying was like watercolor and ink, and they were using the ink to add a lot of details to their painting. So they were they were adding like strands of hair or um, petals on a flower or what have you. So I decided to try that out. And um, there's probably some kind of artist's ink that you may use for something like this. But as a total beginner, I wasn't going to buy that. So I just used pens that I had in my house and I tested out a couple of them to see which one worked best or if any of them worked. And I found that they did work at home pens. So this is not the best painting, obviously. Um, but the one on the left is my attempt at using a big pen to use a rose. The one on the right is a paper mate gel pen. And you can see that the big pen worked just fine. I feel like for a starter who's getting started in watercoloring, this worked just fine. And I used it to draw the whole flower. I don't think it added much to the stem or the leaves, but I will say for the um, petals of my rose, this would otherwise just be a red blob and the pen gave it an outline. Um, the paper mate one, I did the same thing, but it mixed with the water and made all of my colors this very murky gray, ugly color. So just watch out for that. Um, another thing I will say that I haven't done this very much because it requires the ability to draw, which I don't feel like I'm good at. And again, I think this is maybe a perfectionism thing, but I, I don't like when I draw something and it doesn't look perfect. And so I, I prefer not painting with pins, but it is an option if you want to add more details and you find that you're struggling to draw certain, you know, flowers or something that need more detail because the water just mixes together. So to talk about the actual painting itself now, um, there are two main methods by which uh, you can watercolor. And the first one is wet on wet. And this is when you get just clean, plain water on your brush, and then you brush that water directly onto the paper um, first, and then you get the watercolor paint on your brush and then paint on top of the water that is on your page. And this can achieve a very like smooth, watery effect. So you can see from my example painting on the right there, the top blue paint area was wet on wet. And um, you can see it's fairly smooth. You don't see too many brush strokes really. It kind of like the edges are very smooth at the bottom edge where I didn't have any tape and it looks pretty nice. Um, and if I had used a lighter blue, I used a darker one just for the example, but if I had used a lighter one, it would have made a good sky or a background color. However, wet on wet is not good for details. Um, so if you see the red smudges below, that was wet on wet. Um, and I was trying to make little dots. And I did this just to highlight that if you are going to be using watercolors to paint something specific, you won't want to use the wet on wet technique. Wet on dry is when you skip the brushing on of the clean water and just paint your paint directly onto the dry page. And so for my red dots on this example, you can see that they didn't spread out at all. So it's a really good way of getting detailed paint, or sorry, detailed drawings in your painting 
but for the blue section at the bottom, you can see that it looks a bit scraggly. You can see some brush strokes. The top doesn't look very clean. Um, so I would not recommend necessarily using it for like a wide area if you're painting a background or something. And these two techniques can be combined. So you can paint a background um, using wet on wet and then add your detailing on top using wet on dry. And for that beach painting that I had shown a little while ago that I have right here, um, so that's what I had done here. The sand and the sky were painted on with wet on wet. And then once they had fully dried, I added the bushes and the water on using, or sorry, I painted the sand using wet on wet. And then once they were dry, I painted the bushes on using wet on dry. So as with any hobby, when you first get started, you're going to mess it up. And um, that's fine because that's how you learn. But there are a few things that I have done um, that you can learn from my mistakes and hopefully not make the same ones. So the first mistake I made was being left-handed. I have been left-handed my whole life and yet somehow I always forget. Um, and really what this mistake was is that watercolor paint is wet <laughs> and um, I'm not used to painting at all. So when I first got into it, I've been used to, you know, using a computer or writing or doing things that that won't transfer. And if you touch the paint, it's gonna transfer all over your page. So just something to keep in mind if you're brand new to painting, if you're really happy with what you're doing and then you drag your hand through it, um, it will make a mess and it will be frustrating. So just keep that in mind. If you're left-handed like me, you may actually wanna start from the right side of your page if you can. The second mistake I made um, was just using way too much water. This painting on the right was supposed to be a flower and it does not look obviously anything like a flower because I used just an inordinate amount of water. So for the three circular purple flower heads that I was trying to make, flower buds, I had way too much water on my brush and I didn't realize it and I painted directly onto the page. And then the second mistake I made was touching the stem directly to the flower. So then all the paint ran together because water touched water and it made this horrible, murky, brown, disgusting color. There's a lot of ways to combat this. The first is not to just get so much water on your brush in the first place. But secondly, I have found that it's very helpful for me to dab my brush off on a paper towel to get some of the water off. And then third, let it dry a little bit before adding more details. And then fourth, if you are adding those more details, don't touch them to the other wet part. And then the last mistake I want to talk about is don't just dive right into it and try and do a huge painting. I think this was the very second painting I attempted when I was watercoloring. And you can see it's just not very good. It was very frustrating for me because I was like, yeah, I'm going to be great at watercoloring. And I tried this huge painting and it was bad um, because you really need to allow yourself the room to start small. Learn how to watercolor before you try to do a huge painting. Um, so just give yourself room to learn. So just as a final note for watercolor painting, it's super easy to learn the basics. And to do this, I will show you my very first painting, which is quite hideous and embarrassing. Um, it was supposed to be a bird. It is terrifying because it's not very good. The beak just went into the feathers. It looks awful. But you can see a mere two months later, I was able to paint these flowers and they look significantly better than the bird. There's still room for improvement, but you can see how far I was able to come in just a short amount of time. I'm not going to say that it's easy to be an amazing watercolor artist, but it's certainly beginner friendly for doodling or having a mindless hobby during, you know, winter. It's also a really nice way to make gifts or cards for your friends or your family. If I painted some of these flowers, um, I could send those like a birthday card to a friend and that would be very nice. And that being said, whether you like watercoloring or not, I recommend giving art a try. There's so many different mediums of art out there and different people will like different ones. I know my sister is a huge fan of gel pens with coloring books. Um, digital art is really popular right now and there's free software like Krita or whatever that you can use to try it out. Um, some people might wanna go the Bob Ross route and do oil paints. Experiment with several types of art and find one that works for you because really at the end of the day, it's a very relaxing and fulfilling hobby to have. Um, so with that, I think I talked almost up to the minute, but if we have any questions and any time for them, I'd be happy to take them. Yeah, we're about out of time, but there are a few questions in chat. If you could hang out with folks for a little while and answer some of them, that'd be very much appreciated. Definitely. It was an amazing talk and your art is beautiful. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. <laughs> thank and you. You're definitely more talented than me. So <laughs> thank, thank you. you so much, Emily.